Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as Hi, thanks for joining us tonight as we continue in our series, Daring Faith, The Key to Miracles. Tonight, we're going to look at building a life of love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening. We ask that you would encourage us. We ask that you would develop the love, your love, in our hearts and lives. And help us to be everything that you've created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Building a life of love. 
One of the most foundational passages of Scripture on this love that you and I possess as believers in Jesus Christ is found in 1 John chapter 4. The Scripture says, Beloved, let us love one another. Jesus said that by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And here John reiterates this biblical principle that Jesus gave us himself. Let us love one another. And then he tells us why. For love is from God. It's of God. It's His. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's a profound statement. The very existence of God is love. And it says, In this love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. God demonstrated His love by giving us His Son. What did John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The passage continues, In this love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation literally translates mercy seat. It is the place where the blood of the sacrificial animal was sprinkled, that it might cover the sins of God's people. It atoned for the sins. It paid the price for the sins of God's people. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, once and for all, became the mercy seat, the propitiation for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Jesus Christ gave himself as a living sacrifice for each of us. And it says this in conclusion, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, John the Apostle was a big stickler on this. He, he talked about how that you and I need to love one another. As a matter of fact, in 1 John, in an earlier passage, he says, If you say you love God, but you have hatred in your heart toward your brother or your sister in Christ, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. And so we look at this and realize that God Himself is giving us this wondrous understanding that love is central to who we are as believers in Jesus Christ. It's different than all other forms of love. This love is more than just a feeling. It's a choice. It's a matter of we must choose to love others. Love is also a matter of our conduct. People look at us, they demonstrate. Our ability to demonstrate our love shows them that there's a better way of life through love because of God. We're at our best when we actually build our lives around His love. And so we need to understand this love, this love that comes from God. When you and I put God's love into practice, this great love that He showed to us through salvation, and we begin to demonstrate that love that God had for us to others, when we use God's defining love in our lives, it will do a number of things. First of all, God's love completes my joy. It completes the joy that I have in my life. So many people live without joy, but God's love completes the joy that's in my heart and in my life. He said in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4 that this love was given to us that our joy might be full. <clears throat> that word full means crammed full. In other words, it's more than you can possibly contain. Our joy is full because of the love of God. It says also that this love keeps me clean. In the Old Testament, David wrote, Oh, I would hide your word in my heart that we might not sin against you. We want to understand that we do not need to sin. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, John wrote those same words. He said, this love was given to us that we might not sin. God loves us. He doesn't want us to live in sin. When we define God's love in our lives, it also provides for my future. You say, it provides for my future. Yes, God's love is one of the things that demonstrates that I have a home forever in heaven. 
John said in 1 John 5 and verse 13, He has given us and demonstrated to us love that we have eternal life. We know that we have eternal life. And it's God's love that demonstrates that to us. And then finally, God's love creates loving relationships in our life. I have to admit, there are a lot of church family that are closer to me than my biological family. Why is that? Because love that is centered around God creates loving relationships. Close, loving relationships. That doesn't mean you can't have close, loving relationships with your family. And I do have close, loving relationships with my family. But I have some people in my life that are believers in Jesus Christ, a part of our church family, that it has just given me a wondrous, loving relationship with them because of the love that Jesus Christ has shown me. John said that in 1 John 4 and 11. He gave us this love that we ourselves might love others. So defining God's love in my life completes my joy. It keeps me clean. It provides my future. And it creates loving relationships in my life. Now, when we look at not just defining God's love, we look at describing God's love in my life. How can I describe God's love? You ever think about that? We sometimes are called upon to give an answer for something in our lives. And we say, okay, describe God's love in your life. And just off the cuff, sometimes we struggle with the right words to say. I'm going to give you some right words to say. I'm going to give you seven of them. Let's look at this. Describing God's love in my life. Number one, it's unspeakable. <clears throat> I can't even begin to tell you the things about God's love. I can't understand it uh, or why, but I know that I have experienced it. And the most important thing, it's unspeakable. In Romans 8, it says, I can never be separated from it. I can't openly communicate everything about God's love, but I know one thing. I can never be separated from God's love. Isn't that a beautiful statement? A beautiful statement that we can never be separated from the love of God. Number two, it is unending. This love is eternal by nature. It never ends. God's love does not go until we mess up because we all mess up. Anybody can raise your hand to that. We all make mistakes. We all don't live up to everything that we think we should be. There are a lot of people that think you can lose your salvation. But my friend John 3.16 does not read like this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have life until next Thursday when you blow it. That's not what it says. It says everlasting life. And the love of God is unending. The Scripture says in Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's love doesn't stop because we make mistakes. God's love doesn't stop because we stumble and fall. God's love continues and picks us up and helps us to get right back on the track where we need to be. It's unspeakable. It's unending. And get this, it is unselfish. The Bible tells us that God's love asks nothing in return. 1 John 4.19 says, that we love Him because He first loved us. He first loved us. It's unselfish. He gave Himself for us in love. For God so loved the world that He gave, and it was unselfish by nature. Number four, it is unmerited. You and I do not deserve this great and wondrous love that God has given unto us. It cannot be earned. It is not deserved. We can't earn God's love. Some people think, well, if I do all the right things and I stop doing all the bad things, then God will love me. Dear friend, God loves you in spite of yourself. God loves you even when you were doing the wrong things. The Scripture says in Romans 5 and verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for us. Do you sometimes feel weak that you don't have the strength to live your Christian life the way you should? He still loves you. He still loves you. It is unmerited. And get this, it's not just unmerited, it's unconditional. God's love doesn't come with any conditions. All you need to do is accept this love. 
One of the saddest things in life is those who hear about the love of God, those who see demonstrated in the life of others the love that they have one for another as believers in Jesus Christ, and yet they choose to reject that love. God's love is unconditional. You don't need to do anything to come to Him. Years ago, I was out uh, going door to door, sharing the gospel with people, and this pastor was with me, and we went into this house, and we sat this down with this man, and he's sitting there, and he's smoking his cigarettes and drinking a Pat's Blue Ribbon beer, and I just shared the gospel with him, and I said, does that make sense to you? Would you like to receive Christ? And he said, yes, I would. I'd like to receive Christ. Well, this pastor who was with me, he interjected. He said, well, if you're going to accept Jesus, you got to stop that smoking and stop drinking that beer. And that guy said, you know what? You two can turn around and get out of my house. And we had a very unfriendly situation. When we left and got down on the sidewalk, I said, what is wrong with you? I said, you do not clean up to come to Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus and then let Him clean you up. And we parted ways after that emotionally. We were still friends, but we parted ways emotionally because I understood that this man did not know what it meant to have an unconditional love in his life. And he thought that everything was based on what we did. It's unconditional. It has nothing to do with you and I. It's not about what we do. It comes from the heart of God. And He loved us first. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, You did not choose Me, but I chose you. I've always thought about that man. And did he ever come to know Jesus Christ after that? He was so turned off by that merit of a conditional love that God's only going to love me if I do this. And that is not true, dear friend. God's love is unconditional. There's no conditions in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him. What's the key? Not get my life straightened out, but believe in Him he would have everlasting life. And the next verse says this, and this is where so many people and even pastors get messed up. They know John 3.16, but they don't know John 3.17. John 3.17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. See, God doesn't point a finger, an accusative element to our lives. We know we don't have everything together. We know that we need to be forgiven of our sin. We don't need somebody cramming it down our throat. What we need to have crammed down our throat, dear friends, is love, not law. And so we look at this unconditional love. And when you get that part right, then you'll realize this. God's love is satisfying. It satisfies everything in your life and in mine. It fulfills our deepest needs. The Scripture tells us here in 1 John 4 and verse 16, so we have come to know and believe the love God had for us. We came to know that. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. It is absolutely complete and satisfying. And here's the last thing. God's love, it is sacrificing. It is sacrificing. It can never be fully understood, but it can be seen in the demonstration of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is love demonstrated. The Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake He made Him, Jesus, to be sin. Who knew no sin? He had no sin in His life. Why? So that in Him we might become the righteous of God. The righteousness of God. Because of Jesus Christ, when God looks at me, He sees me white as snow. He doesn't see the failures. He doesn't see the sins. He doesn't see the mistakes that I've made. The things that I've said I wish I'd never said. The things I've done I wish I'd never done. He doesn't see any of those things. Why? Because He made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be my sin for me, that in Him, in Jesus Christ, I have become the righteousness of God. It's not my merit, it's not my life, it's not what I've done, but it's all what Jesus did for me. You know, developing God's love in my life does a number of things for me. And I think it's important that we look at these things. 
Developing God's love in my life, first of all, allows me to forgive. You see, the Bible says that God forgave us, and we need to forgive others the same way that Jesus Christ forgave us. You know, there's a story in the Bible in Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8, about Joseph. You know the story of Joseph, the, the one with the coat of many colors? Well, his brothers were so jealous of him that they threw him in a pit and they sold him into slavery. And as they sold him into slavery, he went through the most horrendous of events in life. He was mistreated all along the way, thrown in jail. But one day, God delivered him from all of that disgrace and all of that pain and made him the second in command in all of Egypt. You see, God had a plan for his life. And through it all, we look at Joseph. He was a clear demonstration of the love of God. One day, his brothers, the same ones who had thrown him in the pit and sold him into slavery, they came to Egypt because they were starving and they needed food. And Joseph saw them coming. They were going to try to obtain some food from Joseph. They were going to throw themselves on his mercy, but they didn't even know who he was. And all of a sudden, they realized who he was, and they were fearful and trembling. And Joseph said, I forgive you. You need to understand something. What you did to me, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. It allowed him to forgive the brothers who had treated him so horribly. And that reunion was sweet, and God blessed that forgiving spirit that Joseph had. We need to learn that when you and I allow God's love to develop in our life, it allows me to forgive. How can you walk around not forgiving someone for something that they have done when you yourself have been forgiven so much? The Bible talks a great deal about our need to forgive. Well, how can I forgive? When I love the way God loves, it allows me to forgive. Here's the second thing. It helps me value and redeem situations and circumstances. In Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we read about Hosea and his wife, Gomer. Gomer was an unfaithful wife, an unfaithful woman who even sold herself into prostitutism. And when she went out and did all of that, the Bible says that Hosea loved his wife and restored her life and their marriage back together. How was he able to do that? He was able to do that because of the love of God in his heart and in his life. It was a beautiful illustration of how uh, Israel had been unfaithful to God the Father, but yet he valued them and he was willing to redeem them. And that's exactly what Hosea did for his wife Gomer. He loved her and redeemed her and restored her life back. When you and I have this developing love of God in our hearts and lives, it helps me to value others and redeem what would seem to be unredeemable circumstances and situations. Third thing, it produces health in my life. Um, we look at a, at, a, at a great servant of God, David. David talks about the Psalms. He talks in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. He talks about how that this love of God, it benefited every area of his life. It benefited his body, it benefited his soul, and it benefited his spirit. You and I, you need to look up those verses, Psalm 103, 1 through 4, and see how God produces health in our lives. We become more healthy when the love of God fills us, when the love of God is demonstrated in our life and developed to the point where God can use me. And then the fourth thing that developing God's love in my life does, it also creates compassion. You and I develop a more compassionate spirit and heart toward others when we realize the love of God in our own hearts and lives. You know, Peter denied, he lied about Jesus, and yet Jesus, the Scripture tells us, restored him and told him, on this rock I will build my church. Jesus saw the crowds as they harassed and they were helpless and he felt compassion upon them. He realized they desperately needed someone who had compassion 
and cared about them. When you and I have the love of Jesus Christ in our life, it develops and creates a compassionate heart within us. Now I want to close by looking at something significant. I want to talk about how you and I display love's God in our lives. When you and I display God's love visibly in our lives, it does a number of things. How can I display God's love in my life visibly? How can I do that? Well, number one, it demonstrates a love for the Savior. We talk about Jesus. Uh, I was with my grandfather when I was just a young boy, and we stopped at a service station. And while we were in the service station, um, these two men were talking, and, and uh, they just were Jesus Christ this and Jesus Christ that in a derogatory and an ugly manner. And my grandfather very kindly went over to them and said, you know, I really wish you wouldn't talk about my friend that way. I love him so much, and I hate to hear his name used that way. And they said, what do you mean? And he said, Jesus. And my grandfather had this presence about him that when he walked in the room, you knew God was there. At least I felt it as a young boy, and I understood that. And you know what? He sat there very quietly, not condemning them, but just asked them politely not to use that name. And then he began to share with them why he loved Jesus. I watched as my grandfather knelt on the floor and these two men knelt in that greasy floor on those uh, knees that had carried his name in such an unworthy manner. And my grandfather led those two men to Jesus Christ that day. I remember kneeling on the floor right beside him. I wasn't a Christian. But I understood that something significant was happening. And I watched my grandfather love these two men into the kingdom. He loved the Savior. In John 14, verse 15, the Scripture says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus was talking about His commandments. His commandments to love one another. His commandments to go into all of the world and proclaim this love of God to other people. He said, keep my commandments. Uh, second thing, displaying God's love visibly in my life. We do that by demonstrating a love for the Scriptures. Do you love the Scriptures? Do you love to hear the Word of God? I like that old hymn. It says, I love to tell the story to those who know it best. They seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. You and I need to have a love for God's Word, a love for the Scriptures. David said, I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 and verse 11. You and I need to develop a love for the Scriptures. And when we display that love for God's Word, when we display that love for the Scriptures, it helps us to live the love of God visibly in our lives. We need to also have a love for the sanctuary. A lot of people today don't think they need to go to church anymore. They think that there's no reason for me to go to church, no reason for me to engage in corporate worship, no reason for me to go and be a part of that wonderful celebration of praise and love, which is what every Sunday is. It's a celebration of praise and love. And so you develop a love for the sanctuary. David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you glad when it's Sunday comes around? Years ago, I led a gentleman to the Lord. He was almost blind. He had had kidney failure. He had uh, lost his legs and was on dialysis a great deal of the time. And nearly all of his life, he was away from God. He'd had nothing to do with God. He had lived a life of debauchery and sin. But one day, I visited with him in the home, and I was able to lead that man to Christ. And you know, he had lost track of so many things in his life. And his wife told me, he would get up every day and say, is today Sunday? Is today the day we go to church? Every day of his life until he died from that point forward, which wasn't very long, he was like David here. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. What a wondrous blessing. You and I need to have a love for the sanctuary as well. And then we need to have a love for the saints. We need to have a love for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. 
1 John 4.12 said, If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. You see, when we love other believers in Jesus Christ, His love is perfected in us. He said this, Jesus, I remind you again, by this shall all men know that you are disciples if you have love one for another. That was the key catalyst, the key thing. And then the last thing is this, and this is important, dear friends. We need to have a love for the sinner. You know, I've been in situations in churches where the people said, why are they here? What are they doing here? They don't deserve to be here. I've talked to people who said, I can't go to church. If I go to church, it'll fall down. No, it won't. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because the church is there to love the sinner. The church is there to love the people who are the most unlovely of all. Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Do you know who lived in the highways and hedges? The robbers, the thieves, the, the deceivers, the prostitutes, the, the people who lived their life in ill repute. That's who lived in the highways and the hedges. They hid there because of their sinful and evil nature. And yet the Bible says, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that they might be saved. You and I need to have a love for the sinner. In Matthew 22 and verse 39, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You say, well, you never met my neighbor. doesn't make any difference. Scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we are to love those who are most unlovely sometimes. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Dear friend, if you look down upon other folks because their life is not what it should be, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. Because you know what? Before you came to know Jesus Christ, your life was a mess. And you were just as rotten and filthy as they are. And so we look at this and we understand that Jesus loved you while you were a sinner. He loves them while they are sinners. And you and I need to love them because He first loved us. Dear friend, Jesus loves you. If you don't know for certain if you died that you'd go to heaven, Jesus is waiting with His arms open wide. He wants to receive you into His love. Are you willing to accept His love today? If you are, would you just bow your head and pray a simple prayer with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sin and I want to be able to go to heaven one day. And so I'm going to place my faith in You and Your love for me. I believe that You died on the cross for me and shed Your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin, to wash me white as snow. I believe that when you took your last breath and they took you down from that cross, they laid you in a borrowed tomb, and three days later you miraculously, wonderfully rose from the dead. And if you have the power to do that, you certainly have the power to forgive me and to give me a home in heaven with you. So Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life Will you be my Savior to forgive me? Will you be my Lord to lead me? And will you be my friend to walk with me through the remainder of this life and then for all eternity in our home in heaven? And dear one, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, the Scripture says God loved you. He didn't come to condemn you. And He said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God the Father raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Dear friend, did you accept Jesus today? It's important to let someone know. The Bible tells us that with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made into salvation. If you really accepted Jesus tonight, I want you to tell someone, Tell someone, a friend, a family member, a, a neighbor, maybe a, a co-worker that you know are born again 
believers in Jesus Christ. Let them know that you accepted Jesus. And if you don't have anyone you can tell, tell me. Just contact me there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com and I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for your wondrous love of Jesus Christ today. I thank you that you are a friend and that you're watching this. I just pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, that the Lord would lift his countenance upon you to watch you no matter where you go in this life. And as we part in this time of study right now, go in peace, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, as always, keep looking up.